Hello, and welcome to a car that I feel right at home in. Now this isn't, perhaps surprisingly, a C-Class Coupe. That is typically my sort of old pair of jeans of the Mercedes-Benz model range, but I guess more importantly than what this car isn't, what it is, is a Mercedes-Benz SLC. Or a third generation facelifted SLK with a name change, but we'll stick with the official title for this video. What we're going to do is tell you everything that you need to know about the model, the different specs, the different trims, the different options, the different personalities that this car has depending on how you drive it. And if you're thinking about getting one of these as an approved used purchase, we'll tell you what to look for and what to look out for as well. And maybe having the perspective of someone who spent a lot of their childhood in the passenger seat and, well, the first few years of driving on the roads in the UK in the driver's seat of an SLK will be helpful. That person is me, by the way, in case you hadn't guessed, but if you want to find out about the rest of the Mercedes-Benz and Smart passenger car range, make sure to check out the rest of the videos on our channel. Feel free to subscribe to us as well, but without any further ado, sit back, relax, switch on your air scarf, and let's dive into it. Let's explore the SLC. After a history lesson, of course. In the 1990s, there was a resurgence in the compact roadster market, and Mercedes-Benz decided to enter this with what they called the small SL, or the SLK, with the K standing for Kurtz, not Compressor. Anyway, after a couple of concepts were shown to the public, the production version arrived in 1996 with a huge waiting list. There was a choice of naturally aspirated four and six cylinder engines, along with the supercharged SLK 200 and 230 compressor models. Or you could have the range topping SLK 32 AMG. Now my formative years of automobile adoration were spent in the passenger seat of this exact one. And I can still remember the sound of it far sidling on a cold start, the whine of the supercharger, and just how long a kickdown would take before the engine started howling its way towards the red line and the horizon. I still miss it. The R170 was replaced by the 171 in 2004, which evolved the small SL into something of a small SLR. See what I mean? Maybe more so with the facelift. One supercharged engine was available with the rest of the range being made up by V6s and the V8 powered SLK55 AMG that was both the F1 safety car for a little while and the first black series model from Mercedes AMG. Anyway, I spent a bit of time in the passenger and driver's seat of this generation of SLK, with the sweet spot in the range being the 350, which is surprisingly efficient for a large displacement, naturally aspirated engine. Or slightly less efficient when you're making it make noises like this. Maybe it'll be the subject matter of a video in the future. Who knows? Watch this space. But until that day comes, allow me to introduce you to the third generation, or R172 SLK. No supercharged engines were fitted under the bonnet, although the choice of four, six, and eight cylinder petrols was bolstered by the arrival of a 2.1 litre diesel that made the SLK 250 CDI. And of course, the V8 powered flagship returned. The SLK 55 AMG is firmly on my list of cars I must own one day, along with the Citroen C4 Cactus. Anyway, back to the subject matter of the video, this, the third generation SLK's facelift, or the SLC. Why the name change? Well, this was done to signify where it sits with the core model lineup. So the core model lineup being A-Class, C-Class, E-Class, G-Class, and S-Class. So the SLC is the roadster of the C-Class family, much like the GLC is the SUV of the C-Class family. Anyway, what have we got here? Well, for one, it's in a rather fetching shade of rear number plate yellow, although I must officially call it sun yellow. And the most obvious changes for the SLC compared to the SLK were definitely on the front end styling. Now, I was always a fan of the rear end design of the third gen SLK, especially if it had four exhaust pipes and a nice big diffuser in between them. But I didn't think that the front end sort of matched up with it very well. The rear is a nice 
curved part of the car, lovely haunches, very soft design language, whereas the front was quite sharp and angular. I think the SLC marries the two together and creates a really consistent and cohesive design. I'm a big fan of that. AMG line models all got the black insert in the lower part of the grille, regardless of whether you had the night pack or not. The diamond grille became available either with black pins or chrome pins like we have here. And these headlights are the standard halogen ones with a LED running light just underneath the main cluster, but you could get LED high performance headlights with intelligent light system available as an option. You may also have noticed that there are some badges on the sides and well, they would look rather reminiscent of the embroidery on the headrests that you may have spotted whilst I was driving earlier. This is an SLC final edition. This was a last of the line run out special to celebrate the production run of the SLC and indeed its SLK forefathers until the model ended production in mid 2020. As well as the bespoke upgrades for the exterior, these wheels were standard for all SLC 200 and 300 final editions. 43 got a five spoke design with a yellow flange. There are also some upgrades on the interior, so why don't we jump in and have a look. Final edition touches inside include the floor mats and headrests with SLC final edition embroidery on them. Carbon fiber weave effect for some of the leather on the steering wheel and indeed the headrests. And the seats that I'm sitting on, they are a mixture of black and gray leather with Alcantara inserts and white contrasting stitching. The rest of it feels very familiar, very Mercedes, very SLK, especially in terms of the driving position and the way that it feels as if the car is just wrapping itself around you. It's nice to be back in one of these. It just, just feels like I've come home, really. Infotainment wise, the SLC brought with it a upgrade which brought it in line with the 2015 generation C-Class, the W205. That moved it on from the earlier version of Command with a fresher interface, but the way in which it is operated is still the same. Shortcut buttons on the left-hand side of the console for all of the major features and functions and everything is controlled by the rotary wheel down in the center, which moves in three dimensions. So you can get quickly between the main features by moving up to the top of the screen, and then you can access different settings and features within that at the bottom of the screen. It's very easy to use whilst on the move. I've become very accustomed to having one of these as well. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto came as standard for the SLC final edition. It needed to be something that was specified from the factory in order to get it on earlier models. Lastly on the infotainment, and this might actually ruin the entire interior design of the car for you, but when it was pointed out to me, I couldn't unsee it, so I'm gonna do the same to you. The seven inch infotainment screen is ever so slightly offset to the left. Have a look at it next time you're in the car. If you see a shot of the cabin from behind, you will see it and you won't be able to unsee it. You might also have spotted something strange down here. It is a gear selector. This isn't an automatic. This has the wrong number of pedals in the footwell, in my opinion, which you can have even on the internet. And it is a six speed manual transmission. This was standard for the 180 and the 200s, whereas 250Ds and 300 petrols and of course the SLC 43 all got the nine speed automatic transmission as standard. Auto versions, they have a small, I call it the Cobra's head uh, gear selector down in the center that you just push forwards and back depending on which way you want to go and have paddles on the back of the steering wheel. Underneath the infotainment controls are a row of buttons, which is almost complete. The only one that this one is missing is one for dynamic select that came with automatic models. So we've got controls for heated seats, air scarf, parking sensors, which were standard on the final edition. You can see the little slugs on the top of the dashboard and on the bulkhead behind us that show your proximity, as well as auto start stop, your brave button if you want to do donuts in a car park. And just underneath, there is a 12 volt socket 
a ashtray that says no smoking on it, and something that wasn't standard on the second gen SLK, twin cup holders, which you can also use to hold some rather obnoxiously large sunglasses that will probably offend people as much as my watch seems to do. Further back from the cup holders is a large central armrest. To be honest, I think this is where the third gen model really did improve on the second gen, just in terms of making the most of the space that is available. So there are two USB ports in here, enough room to store your hat. Now you may also be wondering what this little island is here. Well, flip it open and you have the most important controls in the car. So there's a button that will drop all of the windows. Alternately, you can raise them all by just continuing to hold the main window switches on the driver's armrest. And you have this silver button here, which if I cycle the ignition on, will start, well, I think one of my favorite electromechanical ballets ever, removing the Vario roof. From coupe to roadster in just a few seconds, and I'll never get tired of watching this roof work its magic. With the roof going into the boot, that will of course eat into luggage space, but with the way that it folds in three pieces, you don't lose as much space as you may imagine. There's still plenty of room for long weekend luggage in here. Without the roof down, just move the luggage separator out of the way and you increase the height and usability of the boot to 335 litres. And I only found this out when I started filming, this section of the boot is reversible, so you can choose between a bit more height or a flat load space. That's enough sitting around though, this is a car that loves to be driven, so let's go and do just that. First things first, you're going to want to position the car on the road. That's easy to do, I would say. You get good visibility out the front, a good view as well actually of the long and pretty flat bonnet, so you can tell where the corners of the car are. At the rear, you do sit a lot further back than you may be used to, so if it looks like you're being tailgated, you most definitely are. Visibility is all right through the rear view mirrors. A lot of those gorgeous haunches will take up some of your mirror real estate, but the view from them is all right. Just keep in mind with the roof up, you have a lot more metal and a lot less glass just about here than you may be used to. So you kind of have to look around that for checking your blind spot. In terms of ride and refinement, it rides best up at high speeds. Of course, you do make the trade off with the suspension for a bit of low speed comfort in return for that darty handling on a B road that I'm sure we'll explore in a few minutes. But refinement wise, I'd say it's generally a very well refined car. It's quieter than you may think for such a small car, but it does have that hallmark Mercedes-Benz refinement level that well, it should really. I once inadvertently did a back-to-back -back test between the SLC 250D that I was delivering from Stevenage to South Wales with the trade-in, which was an SLK 250 CDI. Now they both drive pretty much identically. The main differences that you'll see are the things that we've already run through with the graphics, infotainment, some of the shininess and the switch gear. The only real difference I could pick up on, if that's the right way of putting it, was in the transmission with the SLC having the nine speed automatic box and the SLK getting the seven speed. Now both of them, they're very much you know, Mercedes boxes like you would expect. Smooth, almost imperceivable gear changes, quick to respond, quick to drop a few ratios when you need them to as well. But over the course of that longer drive, having those extra two ratios really did help to boost fuel economy, which did add up over a long drive, and just reduce the engine noise to, I would say, a bare minimum when cruising along the length of the M4. Back to the car that we have here though. From my perspective, it feels very familiar. It really does feel like I've come home here. It feels like I've been driving this car for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles today when in fact I've only done about 30 so far. It feels like it's more on the GT side of the sports car spectrum and part of that is the fact that the petrol engines are very quiet. You don't hear much of them and it's the same for the 300 or the 200 unless you're putting your foot down. 
You work out whether that is a good thing or not, I say it's a good thing. You may also notice the road surfaces go through varying stages of dampness throughout the course of this video, but this isn't just a car to be driven in fair weather. I've always appreciated how consistently the SLC handles, whether it is bone dry or absolutely chucking it down. It's good to know that the car isn't going to be a totally different animal when the heavens open. As I'm sure you know by now, my favourite roads are the B roads. And it is so nice, so nice to be back in one of these and on a road like this. It's still easy to place, that good visibility that you have and being able to position the car you know, just right, using that flat bonnet as a reference, really handy, even on the narrower roads. You, know, you do feel like you're sitting quite far out. I like that. I like sitting quite literally on the door card. So as far as I'm concerned for B road running, that's good. In terms of the steering, it's not as sharp as a Porsche or a Mini. Then again, don't expect it to be and you won't be disappointed. I'm not trying to set a lap record on the Nürburgring. I'm just trying to enjoy a more indirect route around some roadworks. It's got a lovely, lovely, lovely balance to it, especially with the roof down. The, the perception of having that extra little bit of weight over the rear axle is always, always noticeable when you put the roof down. But it's just, it's a sweet thing. Flow through the corners with the car. You can really lean on the suspension. And even if the car does decide to break free, let's say, it's got a big safety net. It doesn't feel like it wants to swap ends on you. And you know what? I'm quite enjoying having a third pedal and needing to move between third and fourth gears on this road. It's refreshing. Once you've done the commuting, once you've done the motorway, the intercity journeys, get onto a good stretch of road, pop the roof down and enjoy. Get yourself a car that can do both. It can be the Grand Tourer, it can be the sports car. It can be both whilst being something to enjoy using every day. I think that is what this car is all about for all occasions, for all events, and for those opportunistic moments where you think, yep, no rain, no roof, let's enjoy it. What to look for and what to look out for. We'll start with the latter. Make sure that there are no recalls outstanding on any SLC that you are looking at. Earlier models, they had recalls for steering, fueling and transmission. So just make sure that they are done or will be done by the time you pick up the car. Also make sure to have a look in the boot, check the bottom of the storage area for any moisture. That of course would mean water ingress and that is not good. The general consensus though, and I did go around the workshop and ask, you know, what goes wrong with this? Tell me what is the first thing to break on one of these? The answer is they're quite well built. Now you would expect that from a Mercedes-Benz, but equally I could say that about pretty much any car. If you look after it well, it should run like clockwork. But I did ask about the issue that is, I think, quite well known now. On the third generation SLK, you would often get water ingress on the central part of the Vario roof. That was fixed for the facelift that turned it into the SLC. You're automatically covered by Mercedes-Benz roadside assistance for 12 months upon the completion of a service at a Mercedes-Benz retailer. This can be extended until the car is 30 years old. And of course, a year's worth of roadside assistance is something that is included with every approved used Mercedes-Benz purchase, along with a 12-month unlimited mileage warranty. To find out everything that you need to know about the approved used program, take a look at our website. You can find all the details up here. 
The easiest way to tell what sort of equipment any particular SLC has is simply by taking a look. Specifically, have a look at the buttons that the car has. So this one, this black 2016 model that I've switched the yellow one for for now, has a full row of buttons. The one that was blank earlier was the one for Dynamic Select. Heated seats and air scarf were very common options for the SLC, although I have come across a handful that didn't have either of them. I would say for this sort of car, it's an absolute must. Something that could be hidden in plain sight is what sort of cruise control the car has. So, of course, they have the stalk down here to set and increase or decrease your desired speed. But have a look right on the end. You may see a pictogram with a couple of cars and an arrow. And you may also notice a flat star at the end of the bonnet. That means that the car has Distronic radar guided cruise control. Another giveaway is to have a look at the wing mirrors. If they have a triangle in them, then that is blind spot assist. Another relatively common option is what's above us. You could have a panoramic vario roof with a section of glass above you. So you can let lots of natural light in all year round. I absolutely love having that. So I would say it makes a big difference in terms of the perceived space that you have in the cabin compared to the yellow one I've spent most of this video in. If you're looking for a car with electric memory seats, again, a place to look in the images is on the door card as the controls for the electric memory seats are just next to the door handles themselves. And if the car has electric seats, it will also come with electric steering wheel adjustment. Harman Kardon surround sound, that was also available as an option. Again, look out for the additional speaker that is just underneath the door handle on the door card, and that will tell you whether the car has the upgraded sound system or not. Finally, and perhaps most importantly for open top driving in terms of refinement and comfort, is the wind deflector. Now, there were two options. The standard one is what we've got here, a fabric section in between a plastic trapezium that slots in between the rollover bars, but air guide was an option as well. That's two little perspex triangles really that you can twist into position to reduce buffeting into the cabin when you're driving with the roof down. It is quite common for these wind deflectors to vacate the premises let's say when these sorts of cars change hands. It's a little bit more difficult to take air guide off the rollover bars but if the car is listed as having a wind deflector make sure that it has got it when you pick it up. Now, if you're coming to this from, say, having driven previous generations of SLK, give it about a minute, maybe, and you'll feel right at home in the SLC. Familiarity is an absolutely fantastic quality for any product to have, I think. If you are coming to it from another make, another model, then once you get used to the driving position being very rearwards and not having much car behind you at all, I think you'll be struck by the ride, the refinement and the comfort that the car has to offer. Regardless of where you're coming to this car from though, for me it feels like a greatest hits album of all things compact roadster from Mercedes-Benz. Yes, of course, a two-seater is never going to be quite as practical as a four-seat cabriolet, like a C-Class or an E-Class, for example. But if you can live without the rear seats, which I certainly can, then I think you'll find this to be a very well-rounded, everyday usable sports car. So that's what I think, but what do you think? Have you driven an SLC before? Have you owned one? Would you like to own one? Would you like one of these? as your next car. If so, then make sure to head over to our website where you can see all of our approved used stock. If you have any questions about the model, about technical data, specifications, some more detail on how it compares to a second generation SLK 350 facelift, let me know. Feel free to leave us a comment and we will get back to you. Hope you've enjoyed the video. If you want to find out more about some of the current Mercedes-Benz and smart passenger car models, then check out the rest of the videos on our channel. And do feel free to subscribe to us as well, so you don't miss a thing. Well, this video certainly took me on a trip down memory lane, and if it did for you as well, let me know. I'd love to hear it. 
in the description there are some bits that were left on the cutting room floor some more technical info and things to look out for as well as a counter for how many times i said slk in this video but as always thank you very much for watching i'll see you again in the next one